Welcome back to the Book Wanderers Club. Today I have three more brilliant authors who are here to talk to you about their books, about reading and writing inspiration and to set some tasks for you. First up for book chat, we've got Louis Stoll, the author of Otherland. Louis told me a bit about creating a wild and wonderful other land and fairy adventure that she's created, as well as setting a writing prompt for you. Next up, answering some big questions from Cat and Grove Primary School is Tom Ellen, the author of The Cartoons That Came to Life, which is illustrated by Phil Corbett. You can find out about Tom's favourite authors and inspirations, as well as hearing about his favourite football team and if he was a new colour of crayon, which one he would be. And finally, we have Patience Agbarbi, who talks about the second book in her Leap Cycle series, The Time Thief, and tells you three things that inspired this adventure. So let's kick things off with some book chat with Louis Stoll. So welcome to the Book Wanderers Club, Louis. Thank you so much for coming uh, to tell us about your new book, Otherland. This is not the finished copy. The finished copy is there. <laughs> That's what you're looking for in bookshops. Um, so to kick off, could you just tell us a little bit about uh, the book? Give us an introduction to what the story is. Sure. So it's a story about two children. Um, starts at their birthday party that goes horribly wrong. Um, leading to child abduction <laughs> by an evil fairy. And so these two children have to go on a quest to get the kid back. Um, it's one of their little sisters. And so Myra and Rohan are two very chalk and cheese characters on a quest, bickering the whole way. And um, they have to complete three trials to get the kid back from the fairy queen. And it's sort of, you know, it's a magic portal fantasy, but when you get there it's actually quite horrible and I think I'm quite compelled by that idea of like things that are both like an aspirational fantasy place but also when you get into the details it's deeply unpleasant like adventure generally quite unpleasant you don't like I'd much rather you know my, in my personal life I don't want as much adventure as I want in my books <laughs> yes. For sure. I'm always running into this problem when I'm writing book wandering and my editor's always telling me off for choosing very calm and pleasant scenes <laughs> there's no plot here and I'm like but this is where I would want to book yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's that kind of like what's good for the story versus what do I like <laughs> exactly exactly um so to give us a bit of a flavor of the book um do you want to give us a bit of a reading well yeah so I'm gonna read you the prologue two babies are born in the same hospital Two tiny voices cry out. Then they fall silent. Their hearts stutter. Their lungs stop filling. People run. Machines bleep. A parent screams. After an eternity, air returns to the tiny lungs. The little hearts are beating. The parents sob happy tears. All is right with the world, except a rip in the universe has been torn from our world to another, and someone is watching. She knows. If she waits long enough, the hole will grow. She knows if she watches closely enough, she'll find her moment and claim her prize. Time rolls on until one day she sees the flames and she knows it's now. Those babies are gonna wish they've never been born. What an opening. <laughs> <laughs> And I know that this book has been kind of in your brain, in the works for actually quite a long time. So could you kind of tell us a bit about like where it grew from and how long you've been working on it and why now, why was now the right time to write it? This is a good question. More of a question constellation. Okay, so first, how long, <laughs> how long it took was 20 years. So I sat down and wrote the first draft in 2001. It bore almost no resemblance to what what's in the book now. Um, it was about completely different characters. It was a time travel adventure. All it had in common was it had some fairies in it. <laughs> um, actually, it had a half vampire, half fairy character. It wasn't even a fairy. So yeah. um, basically, it's kind of morphed over time. Um, and where it came from originally, I, I do weirdly remember that, even though it was 20 years ago, because it came from um, a university lecture, one of the few I went to, <laughs> um, which was about kind of representations of fairies in literature um, mm -hmm. by a woman called Diane Perkis. And I then went on to read her book called Troublesome Things. And it's basically what everything you think about fairies that's nice is untrue. Everything you think that's horrible is true. They steal children, they kill people. You know, they're just the idea of this kind of 
the darker side of fairies, um, which I'd really enjoyed through kind of reading Neil Gaiman as well as a kid. But um, but yeah, I think it was that lecture that started to crystallise it, and especially because I'd been studying Spencer at the same time. So it was kind of, he's got a book called The Fairy Queen, um, which I, I can't confess, I haven't actually read the whole thing, <laughs> but I read enough to write an essay about it. Um, but I like the idea of like superimposing um, kind of our world onto the, onto the fairy world. So the queen is kind of in that book, Elizabeth I. In my book, she's sort of got echoes of Queenie from Blackadder. Um, oh, but, <laughs> but also that one scene in Lord of the Rings where Galadriel almost takes the ring and she's like I'll become beautiful and terrible as the morning and the night and I think Gloriana the main the villain came out of that idea of what happens if someone who could potentially be a kind of glowing glorious being isn't <laughs> and um and sort of goes to not really the dark side because fairies don't really believe in good and evil but definitely is kind of a twisted representation of that kind of beautiful queen figure right and when they go to other land, so those are the fairies themselves but uh, the the place they live in it feels like you had a lot of fun kind of <laughs> creating <laughs> the details and imagining what that might look like so obviously you don't do, want to do too many spoilers but could you kind of give people a bit of a flavor of um, what other land is like and how you kind of created the setting and the world itself. Definitely. Well, I think that's one of the advantages of something taking 20 years is it's had a lot of time to mull over in the back of my mind. Um, so I think I've been kind of gathering details all that time. So to get to other land, you can't just go straight there. You have to go through a space called the meantime, which is kind of a non-place, which has got a bit of a relationship with the wood between the worlds in Narnia, but it's not all leafy and lovely. It's both dangerous and a bit boring at the same time. It was, it's kind of like a, it's a bit of a non-place. It's where all human dreams go to die. So if you have all these ambitions that you don't fulfill in life, they end up in this sea that's full of kind of um, broken dreams, basically. So it's a sea full of like astronauts or people who owned a little bookshop or, you know, rock stars, all those things that adults never quite got around to doing. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of fun with that place of the kind of, the idea of somewhere very shifting where time doesn't mean anything where nothing stays in its own shape um and it's quite a heavy metaphor for adolescence <laughs> um and then but then you get to the meantime and it suddenly everything is sort of bright and technicolor so it's your you know it's your stepping into oz moment you know but you don't go direct from kansas you go via, from kansas fire like a weird rave <laughs> to um to oz fairyland um and that I wanted a place that was everything's very lurid, very kind of um, I, I was imagining the aesthetics as quite kind of Vivian Westwood, punk, neon, um, sort of somewhere between like kind of club culture and um, a genuine like woodland experience so it's very much out it's very much set outdoors um so i've got some events that i'm planning at the moment where they're basically in my um local cemetery so they would actually be in a kind of a woodland setting but that's a bit unsettling as well because obviously it's a graveyard um so um yeah so i think and building the world i wanted it's not it's not actually fairyland it's a world with kind of multiple beings and i you know you don't actually meet a lot of them you just know that they're, they're off screen so there's a whole world of vampires that we haven't even met um but it's got gods it's got dragons um and fairies themselves are a very kind of wide-ranging set mm -hmm. of creatures i've got some that kind of influenced by different parts of fairy lore so there's a isle of man influence some um, bit of irish fairy lore some english um and i sort of got some of the little cute ones but i always make them a little bit disgusting as well so there's <laughs> It's never just a nice fairy. It's like, oh, look, it's all furry and cute, and then it farts in you. Yeah. Um, I had <laughs> my. I'm, I, you probably know my editor, Tom Bonnick from Nosy Crow. He um, he he swore he wasn't taking the fart jokes out for the sake of it. It was just because <laughs> it was just because they were slowing the pace, which I, I do actually respect. Because sometimes <laughs> I, I think if I've got a weakness as a writer, it's I get a bit carried away, kind of following a stream of jokes, <laughs> and then you sort of realise ten pages later, nothing's actually happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so I always have to think like have these characters actually moved or done anything right <laughs> or are they just sitting <laughs> there chatting man. that's the worst um yeah. and for young writers who are watching um obviously tw having 20 years is not necessary do you have any advice 
<laughs> about creating settings and particularly like otherworldly fantasy settings apart from mulling it over for 20 years. Yeah, so I, I don't think the 20 years is essential, actually. I did a lot of like other things in the meantime. And, <laughs> um, but I would say, um, I mean, I know this is cheesy, very hackneyed advice, but always read as much as you can. So That's read books advice. with good world building because it will teach you how world building works. It'll teach you what doesn't work. So, you know, read your bad book, you know, so it's kind of... Um, like I've just, this is no spoilers, but I just watched the first episode of the Loki series, oh, yeah. um, which I really enjoyed, but definitely is very info dumpy. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> and I think kind of that's one of the things when you're world building, it's kind of remembering to do your world building, but then leaving most of it off the page right. and just having like a hint of something, you know, like something like an expression that the characters use refer to this element of culture that you will not talk about explicitly, but you know, like I, I reference in other land the creatures of the pit and that's a whole other part of other, other land we never go to but they're just kind of it's, it's the bad place but we don't you know we don't go there um that's, that's great. i think also um there's there's great inspiration to be had from your own surroundings and i think i mean i'm a big fan of kind of magic that happens just out of the corner of your eye somewhere quite normal um you know in in the case of other land the portal is in their own house <laughs> um they don't, it's not you know you don't go off on an adventure you're just at home um so adventure can come and find you, I think. And and again, I, for me, like going for a walk is always the best inspiration because you see things you're not, you know, a lot of life can be quite structured and predictable. And mm -hmm. when you're just out in the world looking at things, you don't really know what you'll find. And I, I mean, I'm, I've always got an obsession with like spotting animals when I'm out. So um, like I get very excited when I see a rat in the park. <laughs> Um, but just, I think it's that idea of like, there's a whole world that you've got no control over and that, right. I think that can give you fan fantastical ideas because you might wonder what they're up to. And mm -hmm. if you follow that rat down its burrow, where does it go? And yeah, maybe it yeah. doesn't go the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, at the, back at the start of our chat, you mentioned that Rohan and Myra kind of chalk and cheese characters. Mm. I'd love to just ask you a bit about them. So I, for, cause I'm assuming, you know, the book is very new and I'm assuming lots of readers um, haven't had a chance to read it yet. So could you tell us a bit about Rohan and Myra and what their kind of personalities are like and why you wanted to write about kind of a chalk and cheese pair? Sure. So neither of them were the original characters in the book. Right. <laughs> um, so, so they very much came about together right. as a pair. Um, and I originally had the book written from Rohan's perspective. Ah, um, okay. And because I, I sort of, I love, I loved writing his voice and the very kind of, He's very sort of sardonic um, and quite stressed all the time. Um, but what I realized is writing the character who's quite nervous is it was holding things back a bit. Right. Okay. So realizing that actually Myra's perspective, which is basically no holds barred, she's got no limits, she's got no break, she's got no filter, mm -hmm. um, meant that the story moved faster forward. So I right. think basically, I, I think having contrasting characters gives you a bit of a story engine, like it moves things along because um like the idea that you get um you know pearls are forming in oysters because there's grit in there it's it's in that kind of conflict yeah. um that you you get something exciting um and i think with rohan it's it was about exploring someone who is desperate for things not to go wrong like he's actually got quite a good life and i think while that's a great you know a great thing it also if you're of an anxious temperament that can make you just think about what could possibly go wrong everything right. and and everything does go wrong so maybe he was right <laughs> um i think about like you know you want someone like rohan with you in an apocalypse because he's already like thought of all the solutions to all the problems because he's yeah. worried about them really happening yeah um and uh whereas myra i was i was thinking kind of i sort of thought backwards from adult myra to okay. child myra okay. um, which I, I don't normally do but i just had sort of an image of her as an adult um, and she is basically that kind of your wildest friend, <laughs> your friend who, if you're on a night out, you would never give them like the money or the keys because they lose them. <laughs> um, and just, you know, the one that would probably get arrested at some point. Um, and, but then thinking back, so, you know, age 11, what does that mean? Right. Um, yeah. And it means in the first chapter without too many spoilers, setting fire to the shed, for instance. Yeah. And, and she does everything in such a well-meaning way. Like, <laughs> 
um, she's not malicious at all, but she she's basically got this very charismatic mother mm -hmm. and feels a bit kind of small next to her. So she's always trying to prove how fun she is. And so she sets off a bunch of fireworks, which doesn't end well for her. Um, so, yeah, I think it's the kind of sometimes when I'm creating characters, I think about the kind of contrasting energies first and and the characters grow out of that. So it's oh, yeah. thinking about, yeah, the dynamic. Yeah, it all comes back to what you know what about is what you need for the story, isn't it? And sometimes mm. things kind of come organic. I certainly find some things are just like in my head and they're there and they're organic. And then a lot, it was pretty 50 50, I reckon, for me. The rest of it kind of works backwards from what do I need? Yeah. <laughs> what do I need them to be right now? <laughs> yeah. But sometimes, and it's interesting because I feel like there's not, it's not necessarily, um, one doesn't work I feel like they work well together and and it's nice having a combination of the things that kind of come come just really they're just there and they're part of the story and the things yeah that puzzle out a bit more consciously yeah and I think I do feel like that I mean I really enjoy the conscious puzzling so I I'm kind of glad that it doesn't all come because mm -hmm. it leaves me something to do that's I don't know that I'm actively doing rather than just passively <laughs> my brain's doing it for me you know yeah. Um, so to wrap up, um, firstly, um, are you, do you feel, do you think you will go back to Otherland or if not, can you basically, can you tell us what you're writing? If people have enjoyed Otherland, what, what else can they find that you've written or will, will they be able to find? So in terms of stuff that they can already find, there's the Dragon in the Library series, which is yeah. sort of, um, a little bit shorter than Otherland and more heavily illustrated. Mm -hmm. um, well, as in it's illustrated at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you want a slightly kind of lighter read, um, and that's a magical series where basically libraries are places that lead you not to other worlds, but to other libraries. <laughs> um, but basically it's, so it's quite a safe adventure, I guess. So it's other land is a bit scarier. Yeah. Um, but it's basically about a girl who hates reading, but discovers that magic happens through books and she's a wizard. And it's basically her job to help run a library. So it's kind of, I like putting characters in uncomfortable situations. <laughs> um, and so that, and that's very much an ensemble adventure. It's about three friends and their kind of contrasting skills and needs. Um, then I would love to come back to Otherland at some point, um, no, no promises, um, but the thing I'm working on next is a story about the Norse god Loki and imagining what if he was, because you know, the, the, he's um, often being punished by the other gods in the mythology, um, so what if one of his punishments was to go down to earth and have to live as an 11 year old and go to school, because that can feel like a punishment if you're not having a good day. So um, so it's kind of, it's his diary where basically he's having to kind of prove that he's becoming a good person. Mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't do that very consistently. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also, it's my illustration debut, which is very exciting. Um, so it's done in a kind of Diary of a Wimpy Kid style with comics and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, the idea being it's Loki drawing it. So it's his style really. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I mean, in some ways it's very different. It's the same, sort of probably the same humour as Otherland, um, but obviously much more visual right. um, and a bit more kind of anarchic, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and when uh, will that be out? That's coming out in February next year. So. Okay, so a little bit to wait. Yeah, a little um, bit to wait. But you've got the, uh, your other series for people. But yeah, The Dragon in the Library, The and Monster in the Lake and The Wizard in the Wood are all out. out. At the moment, um, so. And I will put in the description box uh, more details for anyone watching who wants to find out more about Louis and where you can find out about her books. Um, so to finish off, I think I'm sure that uh, young readers and writers will be very inspired hearing about how you have created your books and your world and how you come up with ideas and fantasy ideas. So uh, to finish off, um, you've got a writing prompt. I believe, I hope. <laughs> I, yeah, that'd be awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, so my prompt to you is is about world building, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and because with Otherland, I sort of um, thought about fairyland and thought, how can I make this horrible? <laughs> um, <laughs> my challenge to you is to take some kind of fantastical place or even just a very nice place. It doesn't even have to be a fantastical place and make it horrible. So um, it could be a Disneyland where all the kind of puppets come to life and they're evil, um, just to really ruin your holiday. <laughs> um, or you could pick something like a kind of fairy tale palace. I mean, to be honest, fairy tales are pretty horrible anyway, but like, let's, you know, take it to an even more extreme place. Um, so yeah, just think of a lovely place, a beautiful place, 
and just think, how can I ruin it? Wow, that's an amazing writing prompt. Um, as always, if anyone does any writing based on that, I would love to read it. Um, you can contact me at thebookwanderersclub at gmail.com if you want to say hi or you want your class to be part of big questions or if you do any writing inspired by Louis' absolutely brilliant, if horrible, prompt. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. So thank you so much for coming and being part of the Book Wanderers Club. Congratulations on Otherland, which is out now. Thank you so much. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you very much. So welcome to the Book Wanderers Club, Tom. Thank you so much for coming um, and chatting about your new book, The Cartoons That Came to Life, which is illustrated by uh, Phil Corbett. Um, yeah. So congrats on that. Um, yeah. Before we get into big questions, um, could you just tell us a bit about the book? Yeah, so it's about a boy uh, who's 10 years old called Finn, and he's a kind of quite shy boy who's just moved to a new town, hasn't really made any friends yet, and he's, he's kind of a bit of a loner. He's one of these kids that likes to exist in his own imagination a little bit. And he's a wannabe cartoonist, basically. He loves comics and all this kind of stuff. And he draws these two characters uh, called Arlie and Tapper, who get up to funny little adventures in his comics. Um, and one day, some bullies uh, kind of take the mick out of him and say his cartoons aren't very good, and they sort of throw his sketchbook away. So he feels totally defeated by this, and he says, right, I'm going give to up, give up drawing, drawing cartoons for good. And that night, uh, I don't think it's a spoiler to say this, since the book is called The Cartoons That Come To Life. Uh, the cartoons come to life. Uh, Arlie and Tapper, his characters, suddenly spring up into the real world. And then it becomes this kind of mad thing where, you know, they want to still have crazy adventures and he's trying to kind of keep them contained and figure out how to get them back. So he finds out they live in a place called Toon World, which is where all the toons live. And he's basically frantically running around trying to get them back home safely. Wow. And on the way, learning some nice lessons about life and having some hopes. <laughs> <laughs> hilarious things happen to him as well hopefully yeah um and of course with a book like this the illustration is key and um phil corbett i'm just gonna like i don't want to do any inadvertent spoilers but you, people can see that it's got yeah. loads of great illustrations so what was it like working um with phil and how did you kind of put the story together yeah it was amazing like i wanted to what i should say is that i came i when i was 10 i wanted to be a cartoonist and i drew these characters arlie and tapper oh. and had the comics with them in and when I sort of pitched this idea to Chicken House, I think I probably naively was like, well, maybe I could, maybe I could draw it. <laughs> I would draw like, and then I went and looked at my comics that I did when I was 10 and they were pretty bad, pretty bad. So I was very glad that Phil, who's an amazing illustrator, came in. But yeah, so it was just like, I like the idea of there being bits of comic and bits of graphic novel within there. So you see Finn's real cartoon starring Arlie and Tapper and then they kind of pop up and come to life and they're scurrying about through the book. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it's the first illustrated book I've ever worked on. And that was like a hugely fun bit where you think of a funny, you know, you're writing a chapter and you're like, oh, this will actually look amazing to be mm -hmm. able to show this. And you put a little side note and describe it. And then, yeah, like when you suddenly see the drafts come in, it's amazing to see these things kind of come to life properly. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> and you say it's your first illustrator because I was interested because you've written YA um, and you've written books with other people and you do journalism stuff as well so you yeah. write all sorts of different things in different ways and so I was curious about kind of why you wanted to um, venture into this kind of age group and this style of book. It was more I think it was just that I was like big comic mad when I was a kid and still am still really like you know I love the Beano and Marvel comics and all that stuff um, and it just I just thought it would seem fun actually and it's funny because I've written a, an adult novel that had like a magical element to it uh, that came out last year and that was like when you write an ad adult book that has magical stuff in it you have to like think really hard and, and figure out the actual logistics of all the magic <laughs> and it was kind of more fun in the kids book where not to say there's no rules for the magic, because obviously there has to be rules, but like you can be a bit more chaotic and madcap and you know have crazy stuff happen. Um, it was perfect timing with the siren going past, like it's yeah, just madcap <laughs> stuff, and then we've got a comedy side. Well, could comedy you actually? Thing, but... Could you actually hear that? Yeah, yeah, no, but I like it. I'm gonna leave it in. <laughs> it's giving you a flavour of the place I live in. I think, you know? yeah. I mean, I'm living in a, living in some dangerous streets here. <laughs> so who knows? Who might be in there, anyway. <laughs> um, although magic rules are a tricky thing because i must admit like i died they're the bane of my life my yeah i was gonna say with your because like this has got naughty. a lot of similarities i guess with tilly as well and it's Things like um, life yeah totally that's it's a hard a, it's a hard thing to plan but at the same time it's really fun and that yeah. was a thing of like watching loads i don't know if you watched a lot of pixar but that for me like pixar is like 
the kings and queens at like figuring out an amazing high concept thing, but but also really planning the rules perfectly and, and making it kind of watertight. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting to look at their stuff. Yeah. yeah. Fab, well, are you ready for some big questions from big Cat and Grove Primary School? Okay, yeah. Okay, they are a mix of uh, kind of reading and writing questions and some more um, left field, <laughs> left field things. Okay, so to start off with though, um, Theo um, would like to know what or who inspired you to be an author? Um, to be honest, it's probably my friend Lucy Iverson, who I wrote, uh, I started off writing young adult books with Lucy. Um, and yeah, it was actually to do, you know, I'd never thought that I would be able, it was never on my mind to try and write a novel or anything because it just seemed a totally unattainable thing to do. Um, so it was more her just kind of like gently suggesting like, oh, maybe it could be a fun thing we do together and not putting loads of pressure and not being like, we need to do something and get it published and we need to mm -hmm. take this seriously. It was more just kind of like, wouldn't it be fun if we tried to do this as a kind of exercise, you know, for our friendship in the same way you might like play squash with one of your friends or whatever. We were like bouncing chapters back and forth to each other. Um, so that was a big thing. Yeah, because I don't, I didn't have a huge amount of kind of, still don't really have a huge amount of kind of self-confidence and all this kind of writing stuff. And it's quite hard sometimes to, uh, yeah, have that self-belief required. So it was nice in that way to start with your friend, you know, and you start as a kind of, you share all the kind of worries and you share all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it was probably her really. And it's the Seren, oh, I say it's serendipitous because Lucy's debut middle grade book nice. is out now yeah. also called it's called the house of serendipity so <laughs> i thought yeah, that was a clever pun that you were doing no, i should have i should have <laughs> just run with that and not had that moment where i surprised myself <laughs> <laughs> but yes yeah. um but that's uh pleasing isn't it that those are both out at similar yeah yeah it's cool it's really good um ben would like to know um speaking of other authors are there any other authors who you would recommend reading Yes, there are a lot. Um, I, I should say that I started, I've just started reading um, a new middle grade series by Perdita and Honor Cargill, ah, Diary yeah. of an Accidental Witch, which that seems really funny and really good. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like Sam Copeland's book, Charlie Changes into a Chicken. That was a big, that I did, that was a big book like that, where they're kind of like, there's an equal amount of heart and humor. Mm -hmm. you no, know, that was something I was trying for in my my book as well where you get some big lols but also packed with like some nice stuff that might kind of kids might really relate to mm -hmm. um what else maz evans books i really like the who who let the gods out they're great um there's a book called iguana boy have you ever heard of that book no i don't think so oh, hold on a sec <laughs> james bishop okay uh, uh, it's a series called iguana boy that's about kind of like the slightly hapless sort of superhero iguana boy so it's got that kind of comics tie-in as well and that's that's a really good one um and yeah i should also shout out lucy iverson's house <laughs> which is like honestly I, i'm biased in saying this because she's my friend but it's really good and it is really i fun. thought it was lovely i really yeah. really liked it um and another one where it's a good balance of like kind of fun adventures but also yeah, some yeah, yeah. like deep deep stuff going on and quite asking yeah. questions in a kind of good way to start thinking about quite big big ideas yeah exactly exactly yeah um omar would like to know if you had a teleport gun where would be the first place you would teleport to the third or the first, the first. <laughs> <laughs> is omar just throwing me a curveball yeah. <laughs> first place uh i think probably this is a bit of a silly answer because you if you had access to a teleport gun you should really go either like far into the future or far back oh. into the past but Oh yeah, actually, wait, we need to check with Omar whether this teleport gun can go back in time or whether it's right, just- Right, he hasn't different. specified. I'm going to assume it's a time traveling teleport gun. <laughs> <Okay>. Sure, <laughs> it's a bit of a leap, but sure. Uh, it's not, to be honest, I'm not interested. Um, <laughs> I might go to, I've always got, this is again, quite a boring answer because it's like sort of within my lifetime. But I always wanted to go to New York in like about 1975 or 76. Okay. And you have all this interesting stuff like, disco music and punk music and hip-hop music mm -hmm. all beginning to happen in quite an exciting way uh, in this one small space. I don't know what I would do. I don't think I'd contribute to any of those things. I should <laughs> An observer. <laughs> um, but yeah, probably that. That's a good answer. Um, Theo has asked, 
who more about inspiration so who is your biggest inspiration in your day-to-day -day life and also in your writing well um that's a good question well wow. um i think for, well for, funnily enough for this book the cartoons that came to life there's a book by you know spike milligan who's a sort of um comedian comedy writer and he wrote a book a novel called pakun that was I read what I must have read that when I was about 13 or 14 and that was like it was around the same time I first read Adrian Mole which was like a big life-changing experience and realizing like books can be so funny that you can't <laughs> do anything else basically and but reading this Paku novel was a big eye-opening moment for me and also an inspiration on this book because it was like it basically opens with a quite a standard third-person narrator describing a kind of field and then he starts describing a man in the field and then within the first page the man in the field starts talking back to the narrator and saying like what's going on with these legs like did you write these legs and the narrator's like yeah what's, are they all right and he's like, no they're terrible like did you write your own legs and i know and uh, you know it seems kind of normal now but when i was reading that at 14 i you know i was used to seeing weird stuff happen in books but it always happened within a structured mm -hmm. within a kind of comprehensive structure whereas this was the first time i'd seen someone mess about with like the form of the book and you suddenly realize you can do anything you want like it can be complete chaos mm -hmm. um, and then, so that's the idea you know with the cartoons that came to life i like the idea of like what would these cartoon characters say to me and start, you know, kind of having a go at me and be like, I'm not sure about my nose actually, mate. Like you should have uh, done this or you should have done this. Uh, um, so that was a big inspiration on that. And that's surely something I think kids must think reading your books as well, but like, it's not, a, it's, it's a, this shouldn't be allowed to happen. Like characters yeah. shouldn't be allowed to hop in and out of other stories. It's like, it's quite a thrilling thing. I think when you're young, when you realize someone's totally just messing with the rules and you, you can do basically whatever you yeah. want. With There's naturally no limits. I love that because like my books are so rooted in my own experiences, like you say, of reading those books that broke, like sort of broke the fourth wall or did something interesting. For me, it's like um, Diana Wynne-Jones as an author and she doesn't always yeah. do this, but some of her books are like really playful with rules and genre. It's a book called The Dark Lord of Dirk Home, which is right. like yeah. a kind of play on the high fantasy narrative. And it's got, pilgrims come from our world essentially into this fantasy land and all the people in the fantasy land like forced to like a dark lord is like appointed every year and you have to like you have to but it's awful and it's like ravaging the country because like you have to put so much money into it you have to dress like a dark lord and turn your home into like a castle and it's like these pilgrim tours are like ruining this country right. and um it's just really playful with all the like tropes of the kind of it gives the pilgrims this idea of being in like Lord of the Rings or something, but it's told uh -huh. from the perspective of the, the fantasy land, which doesn't want, they, that's not what they're like and that they yeah. don't want anything to do with it. And it's really expensive and it ruins all their crops every year. <laughs> and right. I just reading that had like that moment for me, like you could just yeah. do anything and you can really consciously play with how stories are told and you can tell stories about stories and um, yeah, 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 I wouldn't have written pages without Diana Wynne Jones for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna check that out. I need to read that. They're, oh, it's really, <laughs> it's such a good book. It's such a good book. Anything that, that yeah. There's another, uh, just very quickly, there's another really good book by Flann O'Brien, who's another Irish writer from, it's an older one, Spike Milligan, but again, that's like about a guy who's writing, trying to write, he's like a student in Dublin, trying to write three different books and he just kind of gets confused and his characters start like- Yes, I love stuff books. like that. It's so good, it's just like, when the characters just sort of take on a life of their own, it's this mm -hmm. brilliant kind of chaos and kind of, yeah for sure right next one love this question Ahmed asked you're a new or says you're a new addition to the crayon box what color would you be and why <laughs> <laughs> this is an incredible question that is a really good question um okay I mean there'd be a lot of pressure on that I suppose because I'd imagine it's like being a new kid and coming into the school cafeteria for the first time and everyone, like all the big guns, the red and the yellow and the green are like kind of checking you out, like, who is this guy? You know, what's he got to, what's he got to, to give here? I'd like, to, I'd, I think I'd like an adjective. Like I'd like to be like burnt orange. Oh, okay. Like yeah. electric blue or something. Yeah. You know, not too over the top, but something that just people, oh, okay, interesting. So this guy's got, he's got a little adjective in there. Um, he's offering something different. Because I wouldn't want to tread on the toes of the red and the green and the primary colours who presumably have been in the packet for a long time and they, sort of, <laughs> yeah. they run the show. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't want to mess with the wrong people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, all right, I'm going to go burnt orange. Burnt orange. It's yeah. a strong choice. Honestly, Thanks. 
What would you? I think I don't, I don't. I haven't. I should have thought about that for myself. But I like the idea of like an adjective, like a new facet to an established colour, mm. yes. place to fit in. And Ahmed, if you're watching this, I think there's a book in this. There's a. Yeah, story I was going to say, like seriously, need to, need to like get get going on that straight away. So like a new crayon turns up in the packet and basically has to kind of like fit yeah. in with the others. Ahmed, you're set. You need to write it. That's the elevator pitch, Ahmed. So yeah. <laughs> And then we'll see you on the Book Wanderers Club in about a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, next is Amy Jane, who asks, after a day of writing, how do you like to relax? Um, that's a good question as well. I do a lot of like procrastinating. I do a lot of like going on my fantasy football team. Yes. <laughs> it's a really boring thing to say. But that's that's a, like, my routine is like, get up, mess around with fantasy football for about an hour, an hour and a half whilst the word document is there, like <laughs> glaring at me saying like, come on mate, like, yeah. stop doing that now. Um, but I mean, yeah, I don't know really. Usually just getting out of the house, because like the thing about writing is it's very like, you're sitting in a room all day and particularly when it's so nice like this, it's just, it's nice to set yourself a little goal. And I usually say like, I have to finish a chapter or I have to do a certain amount of words. I don't know how you do it, but like, maybe that, yeah, like, you know what I mean? Where you, you say like, this is the goal, Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do that, and once I do that, I can then go for a walk and yeah. go for a bike ride or whatever and mm -hmm. get some fresh air, <laughs> basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, this is a good question to follow on from this, uh, because William asked, um, what is your favourite football team? My favourite football team is called Queen's Park Rangers. Oh, they're near me. Are they? Okay. Ish, yeah, ish. Yeah. 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 They're not very, it's the type of thing that's a bit awkward where I live in uh, Paris and so it'll be a thing, you know, often when you encounter someone in Paris, it's like a little kind of ice-breaking question where someone's like, oh, do you like football? What do you like? And obviously you say you're from London, they're expecting you to say like Arsenal or Chelsea or whatever. And I say Queen's Park Rangers, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, they're a great team, West London team. And um, yeah. Yeah. Say about <laughs> that's, no, that's good i'm a newcastle fan i grew up in uh, oh, yeah. i grew up just outside newcastle i've recently got into football actually i okay. have never been into it but my partner's what? family was on a we did fantasy football for the last um for the I don't, i'm not good with the last word yeah the last <laughs> season that's what I'm, <laughs> that's what i'm trying to say um and i got super into it because i'm quite competitive um, where did you finish in second the really out of how many yeah. And my partner came first, and it was, I think, annoying for everyone else, actually. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Not it's done it. <laughs> um, so these are two questions that are kind of on the same theme, so I'm going to ask them both together, because Martina um, asked, how do the stories you write make you feel, and how would you describe the emotions? And Katie asked, how do you feel when you finish writing a book? Wow, these are seriously deep questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, how do you feel when you fit? How do you feel when you finish is quite difficult, as you know, because there's like so many different stages of it as well. Like you finish your first draft, usually after you finish first draft, you just feel awful and you're like, that's the worst thing anyone's ever written ever. And then after the second draft, you might feel a bit better, but it just never feels like, it's particularly with an illustrated book, because there's always so many chops and changes with the, the illustrations and kind of setting it out. Um, but I think it's an amazing, yeah, like with this one, when I actually got the finished copy, it's like, it, and it, if you get a finished copy and you're really happy with it and you think it looks great, you know obviously there's pressures to think about is it going to do well or whatever but I tried to focus on just like look I'm really proud of this book and mm -hmm. I think I would have loved it I mean that's the thing I think with this book I think me age 10 would have been like super into it and I think that's a nice thing hopefully to to have come away with it um and yeah how do I feel I mean yeah particularly with this one it's the character Finn is very much based on me when I was a kid and the kind of like having big dreams of wanting to be a cartoonist and being a little bit shy and all this kind of stuff. And I like the idea, uh, actually, which is, I suppose, Tilly is another character like that and lots of good characters in literature, who are like, who kind of live in their own heads a little bit and, they're, and they're, they're just so much into their imagination that they're kind of just living in books and films or whatever. Um, so, yeah, what was the first question? The first question was really oh, uh, no, 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 like, kind of emotions. Question. Yes, how would you describe the emotions? Um, wow. How do the stories you write make you feel? How would you describe the emotions? Wow, maybe like, I mean, I hope sort of like comforted in a way because I was writing for myself as a, yeah. as a young kid and trying to kind of like make him feel better and make him kind of big him up a little bit. Um, 
but I mean, yeah, the, the overriding emotion is joy and happiness and being pleased with <laughs> how it came out, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so the penultimate question is from Tegan, um, who would like to know who your favourite author was when you were a kid. It probably would have been Sue Townsend who wrote the Adrian Moore book. Mm -hmm. It's not a very original answer, but you know you can't beat how like we were talking about these formative experiences when you first read and you know that was the thing like I was quite into reading when I was 10 11 12 and I liked kind of sci-fi and fantasy and horror and I think probably when I was about 13 I read Adrian Moll and it was like really mind-blowing experience mm -hmm. and just didn't realize things anything could be that funny basically and be that kind of real mm -hmm. um and that's an amazing those that whole series of books is amazing because she's like Firstly, she was like a you know a woman in her kind of I don't know how old she was when she wrote them, but she got inside the mind of a teenage boy in quite an alarmingly <laughs> kind of, uh, like you know well, um, and yeah, and all of them sort of stand up as well when you read all the. It's great because you can kind of grow up with Adrian, and you can. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like reading in the same age as he was, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it would have been it would have been definitely uh, yeah. two thousand. Yeah, and actually because I think quite a lot of the viewers of this tend to be kind of um, probably make sure you're starting at the, starting at the beginning of Adrian. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> don't, uh, maybe that's a good don't, advice. Though. Like, read the, Adrian, the age uh, you are, um, yeah. it's, a good, it's a good way to probably read Adrian Moll. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that was bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, and our last question uh, from Amelia is, do you have any tips for someone who wants to become an author? I, the tip I always say actually is to try to enter competitions um, because that was something that me and so me and Lucy started right Lucy Iverson we started writing together and we didn't really have any plans we didn't know what would happen with it and we saw this competition that the chicken house runs with the, with the times and it wasn't even like oh we're going to win this competition but it just provided us with a deadline mm -hmm. which when you you know when you're starting writing a lot of the time you have others you have school or university or you have we both have jobs so it's quite a hassle sometimes to be like, I've got to spend my weekend writing, or I've got to come back from work and write. And a lot of the time you just think, well, actually, can we really be bothered with this? But when you, we always had that thing of like, no, we said we'd meet that deadline. We said we'd send it on that deadline. Like it wasn't really about winning the competition. It was just like, let's finish it by that date. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, luckily for us, we got, we did get through, we got shortlist on that. And that's how we kind of met various people that helped us start our careers. But even if nothing happens, it's not about that. It's just giving you the reason to finish it. I think that's really important. Like finding a finding a reason to keep going and finish it. Yeah. Which and I would also say, actually, I don't. Sorry, I was <laughs> just going to say that there's loads of competitions for younger writers as well. Like yeah, yeah. the Times Chicken House one is obviously for people a bit older, but that's good advice for any age. Like there's yeah, lots yeah. of writing competitions, and if you maybe subscribe to like magazines like The Week and stuff like that, I'm sure that they run things that are for your age group too. Yeah, yeah, totally. Just have a look and see. And the other thing I was going to say, which is that you know, obviously not, it won't be everyone's cup of tea, but I do think kind of collaborating is quite a good way to get started. And again, it, it pushes you on because your fellow collaborators are telling you like, come on, you know, I'm expecting this chapter back from you. You need to get it done. Um, and also it's just it's a really fun way to write you can do it like a kind of elaborate game of consequences where you write a chapter and you send it to your friend and your friend might take it in a totally different direction than you were thinking and you're like well okay so how do I deal with this I'm gonna have to deal with that you send it back um, so yeah that was something that worked quite well for me and for Lucy I think so yeah maybe worth a try if you've got another friend with literary aspirations yeah <laughs> that's, that's, that's very good advice um Right, those were your big questions. They were great. <laughs> they were very thing. big. They were very big. Yeah, um, <laughs> and thank you again to Cat and Grow for sending them in. Yeah, thank um, you. I hope you've enjoyed uh, hearing uh, the answers. And Ahmed, we look forward to your, uh, your crayon book, magnum opus about crayon. For sure, for sure. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, uh, Tom, for coming on. Congratulations uh, on the cartoons uh, that came to life, which is out next week. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Congratulations. Well, this is what you're looking out for in bookshops. Um, and there's a link in the description box as well if you want to find out more about it online. Um, so thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Anna. It's great. <laughs>
cover that you're looking out for in bookshops, uh, The Time Thief, which is out now. So we're going to try and go light, not too spoilery, but we are going to about the second book, but we are going to kind of talk about some of the inspiration. So Patience is here to talk about where she gets her ideas from, because that is the question I get asked as an author the most. So this little section of the Book Wonders Club is to give you a bit of insight into how real authors who are publishing books get their ideas so before we get into those things could you give us just a bit of an introduction to the series and um l and the books yeah the, the leap cycles a time travel adventure series um and that the, the idea is that l my my hero is um she's a leapling she's born on the 29th of february but she has a very rare gift which is the ability to leap through time and um and basically, yeah, she goes on various adventures in, in the infinite. She goes to the year 2048 to solve a mystery. And in The Time Thief, um, something goes missing at the very beginning of the book and, um, and she has to go on a quest. And this time it will be to 1752. So in The Time Thief, she's going back in time. And I, I loved so much the historical element. It's so much fun imagining the past through uh, modern eyes. Um, so I've asked patients to think of three things, three specific things, it could be anything, um, that inspired this new book. So do you want to share the first item uh, that inspired you? Yes, in fact, it's, it's rather large, actually the physical item. To show. I don't know whether I can actually put it into the frame. But, um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, this is, can you see okay? This is yes, incredible. <laughs> Yeah, this is an hourglass, a very big one, actually, um, probably quite a lot bigger than the one that would have been in the book. But I was basically as inspired by um, a trip to the, um, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, uh, where they have like a time, a time section, a time museum. And I actually um, saw a lot of amazing, really, really ancient sunglasses, maritime sunglasses, and they were so beautiful. And I thought, I really want to have one of those in my book. And there was another reason I wanted to have one of them is that when you turn it on its side, then it forms the infinity symbol, which of course is the sign of the infinites, which I'm wearing here as well. So I sort of liked, I like the sort of the visual play you get with it. I like the idea of the sand going through and, and of course they, they were used to measure time and they were used on ships in, in way back to measure time. So, so I knew from the very beginning of the series that I wanted to include an, a very important historical sand glass in one of my books and it features in the time thief and when did you did you know straight away like at what point did you realize how you're going to how you were going to use it did you kind of have a scene in your head as soon as you saw the hourglass or did it take a little bit of time to work out how to work it into the story um, it took a bit of time, but I knew that I wanted it to be in the very first chapter. And then, of course, it had to be in a museum because, you know, I'd seen it myself in a museum. Um, so I like this idea of this this very precious object being seen in a museum and being quite central to the plot. And then no spoilers because it's on the back cover. It's <laughs> stolen in chapter 0100. In the first chapter, this beautiful historical hourglass is stolen in front of the leapling's very eyes. And to say it's up to my heroine to to see where it's gone and to get it back. Um, and what is your second thing that you've uh, chosen for your kind of where you got an idea from? Right, well, I haven't got a, a picture of this one, although but you can look it up online afterwards. But but it was also when I was when I was in the um, the um, Royal Observatory, they actually mentioned 1752 as being an important year because 11 days were cut from the calendar. So, uh, which I kind of knew about because my boys had, um, had mentioned it in one of their books, It Can't Be True, many years ago, and now I've forgotten about it. And so suddenly being reminded of that, I thought, 1752 is also a leap year, and my leaplings really like their leap years. So I thought, right, this is it. I'm, I definitely want to include 1752, and I definitely want to include something about these, these days being kind of snatched out of the calendar. So in many ways, The Time Thief is both about the theft of the hourglass, but of course, it's also about the theft of the 11 days. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, yeah, so it took me a long time to work out how to weave that into the plot. And that comes quite a bit later, but, um, but it's quite important to the plot as well. But sometimes you stumble across those things, don't you? Where, like you say, like it, it was in that year, there was a leap year and you've already, and you just, it, you, you don't necessarily know quite how you're going to make it work, but it seems to have just been something that's made for you and you've got to find a way uh, to work it in. And I just, I didn't know that fact until I read your book and we were chatting and it's just, it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting thing, isn't it? And it's fun to just think about, yeah, um, 
I, like it's the what ifs isn't it which is where a lot of ideas come from I think yeah absolutely yeah and, and I just thought imagine if your birthday had been because what they did they cut 11 days so the the 2nd of September was followed by the 14th of September 1752 imagine if your birthday was sometime in those 11 days you'd be really cross wouldn't you yes so how would you celebrate sure. it? And yeah. I suppose it also it also reminded me slightly of the Leaplings, because, of course, if your birthday is the 29th of February, you only, strictly speaking, have a birthday once every four years. Right. And yet the other three years, you've got to sort of choose the 28th of February or the 1st of March, mm -hmm. which in itself must be quite um, kind of frustrating, but also make you feel quite special as well. Right, right. Somewhere in between. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, time, honestly, I, just, I, I can't think about time <laughs> for very long without like getting a bit funny in my head and I feel like I don't know writing about time travel I'm in awe of anyone who can keep track of uh, time travel in a books and working out how it all fits together um and so what is the third uh thing that inspired the time thief okay but it's actually a person I can sort of cheat it's kind of two people really <laughs> because um once I decided on 1752 um I don't know very much about the 18th century well, I know a lot more now but I didn't at the time but what I did know was that a very very famous dictionary came out in 1755 um Samuel Johnson's dictionary he's known as Dr Johnson the most celebrated figure literary figure of the 18th century so I thought well he must have been working on his dictionary in 1752 so I decided that that needed to be in but then then something even more amazing happened. I found out that in 1752, um, Dr. Johnson's wife died and to cheer him up, a friend of his actually gave him, I know it's really dodgy, but gave him this young black servant who was called Francis Barber, who then actually became, they became very, very close. And Dr. Johnson in time actually treated him like his own son. Mm -hmm. And when he died, he actually gave Francis Barber his fortune. So this is, um, this is uh, a picture of him on a book when he was a grown man. Um, which which was kind of um, it was it was a painting by Joshua Reynolds, who of course was another very celebrated painter in that era. And um, they they don't necessarily think that he did it; they think that some of his um, his apprentices did it. But even so, it's it's kind of after the style of Joshua Reynolds. And um, yeah, Fran Francis was was became quite a famous figure because of his association with Dr. Johnson. But the fact that he was a ten year old boy when he joined the, the Johnson household I just thought that's that's something a lot of people are going to relate to um, very interestingly he, you know, he was a slave in Jamaica but when he came to Britain it wasn't clear whether he was a slave or not because the British laws were quite ambiguous mm -hmm. and um, and during Francis Barber's lifetime they actually abolished um, slavery in Britain because there were quite a few court cases so all sorts of things and I really wanted to celebrate this black historical figure because of course Dr Johnson is so famous right. but not everyone's heard of Francis so I thought right I'm going to have Francis in my book and I'm going to have the, the, the fact that the hourglass actually belonged to him mm -hmm. which you do learn in chapter one so there's no spoilers there <laughs> yeah. and that's an interesting as well because of course Elle um to start with she's excited about going back and fast and she's still excited about going back and fast but of course she has to kind of negotiate going back and being a black girl in history and she kind of has to really people react to her differently and she has to factor that in and that must have been an interesting thing to kind of yeah what why did you what did you want to kind of explore with that and did you do kind of much research into black communities in London at the time? Yes, yes, I did. I mean, I was very, I was familiar with a book called Incomparable World by S.I. Martin, which is an adult book right. where um, he researched like crazy about things. Yeah. So I actually got in touch with him and he was very, very helpful. And, um, and I read various bits, you know, various bits online, various books. The Fortunes of Francis Barber has a lot about the status of black people. And it's written by the, um, the curator of Dr. Johnson's house. So it's, yeah. it's pretty historically accurate. It's, it's, it's an amazing, really new, moving book, actually. Mm -hmm. Recommend it to to anybody but um but yes yeah, so I did I did quite a lot of research around that I didn't I didn't want to get too bogged down in that side of things because in a way it would have made it into a different kind of book I mean that was one of it was an important element of the book but I also wanted to to show a kind of a, a lighter more fun side in the idea that Francis is completely excited of course about meeting these these kids from the future you know going back to visit him and befriend him and they're all a bit older than him and they kind of help him out and support him and befriend him and it's about friendship as much as anything else very much about friendship you know across across the ages yeah and Francis takes them to see uh, the bridge across the river with all the houses on it before the great fire London honestly I think that is, if I could go back in time I would want to see the bridges with all the with all the houses crammed on I think that must have been just be the most amazing sight to see 
Yeah, yeah, it was lovely. It was lovely researching all that. My husband had actually told me that already because I, I kind of it's one of the few things I, I knew about the 18th century was that that London Bridge was still, you know, still had all the houses. And then, of course, once they knocked it down, they realised that that wasn't going to work yeah. for the next one. And what was also exciting, Westminster Bridge was um, was built in 1750. Oh. You know, it wasn't before then. There wasn't there wasn't a bridge across from Westminster. There was only London Bridge, and then nothing for a very long time, long way. So, all of those things are just fascinating. You know how different London would have looked. It would have smelt differently, and yes, of course, people's attitudes would have been very different as well. And then to finish off, as we're talking about ideas, and we talk, you've talked about three things that inspired the time thief and where you stumbled across them for young writers and readers who are watching what advice and tips would you give um to young writers who maybe feel like it's a diff they find it hard to kind of come up with new ideas well I think one of, one of the things I found the most interesting when I was researching was going to Dr Johnson's house mm -hmm. you know and I think especially if you if you're looking at history and stuff like that is to actually go to a place and physically look at objects and things that people use I think this I think when you read you know history maybe in a book it's very hard to imagine but I think when you actually go into these old houses or old museums or whatever and, and look at objects and if you can handle them all the better and actually get a real sense of what of what they're like and even now of course you can do a lot of online visits as well you know because obviously we can't all get to places like we used to as easily but we can really look at stuff but I think objects can a really good way actually of, of, of opening that up the imagination you know something physical that you can hold um, or imagine holding in your hand something visual that looks quite exciting mm -hmm. I think it's a really brilliant way into creative writing yeah fab thank you so if you want to find out a bit more about those items and how Patience has woven them into her story um, The Time Thief is um, out now although I would recommend starting with the Infinite, which is the first book um, in the series. Um, uh, so thank you so much for coming and telling us a bit about where you get your ideas from. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Anna. Anna. I called you Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. I, I've made your name into a palindrome, you see, which is L's really into her palindromes of words that read the same backwards and forwards. But yeah. so is Anna. Anna's a yeah. palindrome. It Agreed. is indeed. I've always enjoyed that. I've always enjoyed having a palindromic is that how you say palindromic yeah. name? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks again, Anna, for inviting me. To be Thank you. So there we have it. I hope that you have enjoyed hearing from Louis, Tom and Patience about their books and picked up some inspiration and ideas for your own writing and reading. As always, if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can find me at that email address there, thebookwanderersclub at gmail.com. And if you go to the bookshop.org.uk link in the description box, you can find out more about the authors and their books, as well as all the authors who've been on the episodes of the Book Wanderers Club. I will be back with three more authors on Friday the 30th of July, but until then, happy book wandering. <laughs>